Does RAM choice really matter for Intel CPUs? In this video, we are going to find out. My name is Matt, I'm a former rocket scientist, and my goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. In the Is It Worth It series, we've been helping you make the right choice by showing you just how much you can expect to increase performance with a drop-in upgrade. In this video, my focus will be on measuring the impact of memory speed, latency, and rank on Intel Raptor Lake and Arrow Lake CPUs. In addition to showing you benchmarks across eight games, I will also show you how to match your CPU with the right RAM kit, something that has recently become much more important. And if you stick around, I will demystify memory gear modes and show how they impact system performance, something every CPU user should definitely not miss. It's really not rocket science, so before we jump into the benchmarks, let's first take a look at the best way to match your RAM with the right CPU. In late 2025, there was a significant increase in RAM prices driven primarily by the rapid growth in AI, and in particular, the announcement that OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, GPT had secured the rights to 40% of the global RAM supply. This was then followed by Micron announcing that they were closing their consumer focus business, Crucial, which was in turn followed by reports that Nvidia was stopping shipments of VRAM to its adding board partners. Furthermore, Samsung and SK Hynix, the other two large memory chip manufacturers, made statements that the global RAM shortage wouldn't be resolved until 2027 and that they do not plan to ramp up production to meet the increased demands of AI, instead focusing on profitability. All of this means that we are likely facing a prolonged period of higher RAM prices. So what should we do? For those of us still on a DDR4 platform, does it even make sense to upgrade? I explored this question in detail in my DDR4 versus DDR5, does it really matter for gaming video, where I tested a kit of DDR4 3600 CL14 against a kit of DDR5 7200 CL34 on an Intel 14900K. A nice attribute of Raptor Lake is that it's the only CPU to support both DDR4 and DDR5. So although you need to use different motherboards, you can use the same chipsets and CPU. When we look at the average gaming performance across 16 games, it's clear that the significantly higher bandwidth of DDR5 memory more than offsets the relatively small increase in latency. However, when you dig a little deeper, you see that the DDR4 3600 kit actually beat the DDR5 7200 kit in at least half the titles, and by relatively large margins, which would indicate that in titles where the GPU is highly loaded, latency becomes much more important to extracting maximum performance. To explore this further, I added a kit of DDR5 6000 CL30 to the mix, and I reran two games. The first was Microsoft Flight Simulator because it showed very linear behavior with speed, and the second was Far Cry 6 because because it was the only title where DDR4 memory won at every resolution. When you look at the Microsoft Flight Simulator results, you see the linear behavior continue, which would be indicative of a game that is highly bandwidth dependent. However, when you look at Far Cry 6, you see that the increased latency hurts a DDR5 6000 kit, which is indicative of a game that is highly latency dependent. The problem, of course, is value. And at the time I made this video, the DDR5 7200 kit was only $40 more than the DDR4 3600 kit. However, However, that same 7200 kit is now a whopping 96% more expensive than the 3600 kit, which completely eliminates any performance advantage. So yes, DDR4 is still a viable option, at least for now. A different approach would be to buy lower speed DDR5 RAM. But does that make sense? In my recent What's the Best Memory for AMD AM5 Ryzen X3D CPUs video, I showed the impact of varying speed, cast latency, rank, and infinity fabric clock on performance across 10 games. As you can see from the benchmark results, the DDR5 8000 kit performed better, especially in the 1% lows, but not in a meaningful way. This is also true for the low latency kits where the DDR5 8000 1% low performance was only 1.2% higher than the 6000 kit. This indicates that it's speeds below 6,000 megatransfers per second, the impact on performance will be minimal for X3D CPUs, something I was able to show by extrapolating down to a speed of 5,200 megatransfers per second. At those speeds, a loss in performance for X3D chips is only around 1% relative to 6,000, which isn't meaningful. This is helpful to know because currently a 32 gigabyte kit of DDR5 5200 CL40 on Newegg is around 40% cheaper than a kit of 6000 CL30 for basically no drop in performance. So lower speed DDR5 kits are indeed a viable option, but only for AMD AM5 Ryzen X3D CPUs. An alternative to using DDR4 or lower speed DDR5 kits is to try an entirely different approach. Traditionally, PC builders would focus on buying a CPU and motherboard first, and then select a RAM kit to match. But given the new reality of higher RAM prices, perhaps we should rethink this strategy. 
At current inflated prices, RAM is now the second most expensive component inside your PC, surpassing your CPU, motherboard, and storage. This means that instead of starting your PC build by selecting a CPU and motherboard, you may need to start with RAM. Your RAM choice will then drive the CPU and motherboard options that you consider. To help with this, I created a simple table outlining the best CPU options for different RAM speeds. You can of course manually tune your RAM, but most consumers will simply use an XMP or Expo profile. So if you buy a kit of RAM below 6,000 mega transfers per second, then you should choose an AMD AM5 Ryzen X3D CPU to maximize gaming performance. If you buy a kit between 6,400 and 8,000 and want to run an XMP Expo memory profile, then you should select an Intel CPU since the unified memory control on AM5 Ryzen CPUs will need to be placed in gear 2, which will negatively impact the performance of those CPUs, as shown in my What's the Best Memory for AMD AM5 Ryzen CPUs video. Between 6000 and 6400, it makes sense to pair it with an AM5 Ryzen CPU, and between 8000 and 8400, you can choose between an AMD 9000 series CPU or an Intel CPU, but if you do choose Raptor Lake, you will need to buy a 2DIM motherboard to enhance your chances of achieving stability. Beyond a speed of 8400, mega transfers per second, you will likely need an Arrow Lake CPU and Kudim RAM. So hopefully this will help you on your PC building journey to better navigate the RAM apocalypse. As mentioned earlier, the focus for this video is on measuring the impact of memory speed, latency, and rank on Intel Raptor Lake and Arrow Lake CPUs. The test systems being used to run the benchmarks are summarized in this table. I used a high-end Z790 Apex Encore and Z890 Unify X motherboard for each system. I specifically chose 2DIM motherboards to enhance memory stability at higher speeds. The remaining components were standardized across each system. An RTX 5090 was selected to place a high load on each CPU and was tested at default clocks. I also used Thermal Grizzly Graphene Cryo Sheets and I applied a number of performance enhancing tweaks to each CPU. For my 14900KS, I was able to unlock max performance by making the following tweaks. 1. Set ASUS Advanced OC Profile to Multi-Core Enhancements, Remove All Limits, 90 degrees Celsius. 2. Turned XMP on. 3. Set DRAM Refresh Interval to 65535. And 4. Change Windows Power Plan to High Performance. A comprehensive step-by-step -step guide for how to implement all of these tweaks and test for stability is contained within my recent How to Tweak an Intel 14900K for Max Performance video. One important point worth noting is that I intentionally decided not to push the 14900KS further because of the recent degradation issues experienced by higher-end Raptor Lake CPUs. For my 285K, I was able to unlock max performance by making the following tweaks. 1. Set P cores to 5.7 GHz and 5.5 GHz. 2. Set E cores to 4.9 GHz. 3. Set the ring ratio to 4 GHz, NGU fabric to 3.4 GHz, and D2D interface to 3.6 GHz. 4. Set the performance preset and BIOS to MSI Extreme settings. 5. Turned XMP on and set T Refi to 65535. And 6. Change Windows Power Plan to high performance. A comprehensive step-by-step -step guide for how to implement all of these tweaks and tests for stability is contained within my recent How to Fix Intel Core Ultra CPU Performance video. For RAM, I selected multiple UDIM and QDIM XMP kits to test. In order to thoroughly test the memory, I ran the benchmarks at 1080p low settings. This will place maximum load on the CPU, which is the best way to determine if RAM will have an impact on gaming performance. I also decided against using frame generation for the benchmarks to avoid any skewing of the results. I did however use upscaling, but only when it was automatically selected as part of the standard graphics options, which when used is clearly denoted on the charts. Furthermore, for each benchmark, I included the Game Quality Index or GQI metric to help provide additional insight into the relative impact that each RAM kit has on your overall gaming experience. With the memory kits ready to go, let's check the benchmarks.
For the 14900KS, I tested three kits of RAM. As you can see from the average gaming performance, the increase in the 1% lows is meaningful, with a 6% increase in performance going from 6400 to 8200 mega transfers per second. In fact, combined with a 3% increase in average performance, this resulted in a 9% improvement in overall gameplay experience, which is significant. Games that heavily load the RAM, such as Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024, showed significant increases in performance, whereas games that heavily load the GPU, even at 1080p low settings, such as Black Myth Wukong, show a much lower performance increase, as expected. For professional workloads such as FEM, CAD, and CFD, the increase in performance is again quite linear, which isn't really surprising given that many of these workloads are heavily dependent on RAM. Let's see if these trends continue for Arrow Lake. For the 285K, I added three kits of Kudim RAM so I could explore the impact of higher speeds on performance. As you can see from the average gaming performance, the increase in the 1% lows was significant, with a 7.4% increase in performance going from 6400 to 9000 mega transfers per second. This was accompanied by a 10% improvement in the overall gameplay experience, which again is significant. However, when you push higher than 9000 mega transfers per second and switch the memory controller to gear 4, the performance drops a lot, something that will be discussed in more detail later in the video. For the Arrow Lake platform, I also explored the impact of varying cast latency, which shows a meaningful increase in the 1% lows as you tighten the timings, and the impact of rank, which shows a relatively small increase in performance of around 2%. Reducing your cast latency is relatively simple to do and something I would encourage. However, purchasing a higher capacity dual rank RAM kit in the current market is only something I would recommend if you have a definitive need for it, since it offers limited value for gaming. As I've mentioned in previous videos, one of the strengths of Intel CPUs is their memory controller. It's objectively superior to what AMD offers on Zen 5, and as a result, it's able to support memory speeds well in excess of 8,000 mega transfers per second. One thing that is important to understand, however, is that the memory controller gear ratio that you select will have a large impact on performance. Memory gear modes simply represent different clock speed ratios between the inner integrated memory controller or IMC and RAM. Gear 2 runs the IMC at half the RAM speed, which is a 1 to 2 ratio, whereas Gear 4 runs it at a quarter speed, which is a 1 to 4 ratio. So for a DDR5 9000 kit, the IMC would run at 4500 MHz in Gear 2, while for Gear 4, it would run at only 2300 MHz. This ratio will have a significant impact on RAM latency, with the 9200 kit in Gear 4 having a 17% higher latency than the 9000 kit in Gear 2. Given this, you may be thinking, why not just remain in Gear 2, or better yet, why not run your IMC in Gear 1. The reason why you can't do that is stability. For DDR5 on Intel systems, Gear 1 is typically not stable. You can use it for Gear 4 or AMD AM5 Ryzen CPUs up to around 6400 mega transfers per second, but for Intel DDR5 platforms, it doesn't work well. 
It's also the reason why you can't simply use gear two above 9,000 mega transfers per second. So what impact does the gear mode you select have on performance? As you can see from the benchmarks, a 9200 kit in Gear 4 offered very similar performance to the 6400 kit in Gear 2. This represents a large reduction in performance over the 9000 kit in Gear 2. In fact, if we plot performance versus RAM speed and assume that the trend line is the same slope for Gear 4, then the performance at 10,000 mega transfers per second in Gear 4 would only be equivalent to 7200 in Gear 2. Furthermore, you wouldn't be able to match the performance of a 9000 kit in Gear 2 until you reach around 11,800 mega transfers per second in Gear 4, which is obviously beyond the current DDR5 RAM capabilities. So I wouldn't recommend buying RAM kits above DDR5 9000, even if you can afford them them because it will take a while before memory controllers can support the speeds necessary to make Gear 4 worthwhile. In this video, I tested multiple DDR5 RAM kits to see if buying higher speed, lower latency or higher rank memory for Intel chips is really worth it. As you can see from the average performance across 8 games, there was a meaningful increase in performance with speed, especially for the 1% lows. In fact, this helped to improve the overall gameplay experience by around 10%, which is significant. However, this was with the memory controller in Gear 2. In Gear 4, the latency increased by around 17%, which significantly impacted gaming performance. If we look at cast latency and rank, the impact is relatively small, but still meaningful, something that should be considered when deciding what RAM to purchase. Furthermore, if we look at professional workloads such as 7-Zip, it's clear that speed helps in some workloads, but not in others. So it's important to carefully assess the RAM needs of your specific applications before making a purchase. But what happens when we look at cost? A baseline DDR5 6400 CL32 kit that used to sell for around $100 now sells for around $400, which is obviously crazy, but unfortunately a new reality given the surge in demand from AI. If you convert these prices into gaming value or FPS per dollar, then it's clear that for both Raptor Lake and Arrow Lake, the best value option is obviously a lower speed DDR5 6400 kit with tight timings. If you're on an Arrow Lake platform, you could try using the Intel 200S boost feature to overclock your RAM or manually tune it, but these approaches are not guaranteed to produce stable higher RAM speeds. This is a somewhat disappointing result for Intel given that their memory controller is one of their biggest strengths. If high speed RAM is simply too expensive to consider, then Intel loses one of their only advantages of this current generation. One thing to keep in mind is that this is the best case scenario at 1080p low settings. So if you game at higher resolutions and settings, your reliance on RAM will be reduced even further, which in turn means lower performance increases, making higher spec RAM even worse value. Before the RAM apocalypse, I was a proponent of the Intel Core Ultra platform for gaming, but unfortunately now it's a very tough sell compared to what AMD offers. In fact, the X3D chips, which are relatively insensitive to RAM speed, will allow AMD to ride out this storm better than Intel. Remember, it's not rocket science, it's Lego. My goal is to help you make the right component choices and put them together the right way every single time. Thank you for watching this video in the Is It Worth It upgrade series. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button and subscribe so you don't miss out on future episodes. And if you'd like to support the channel further and gain access to live Q&A sessions, RAM giveaways, and a Discord server, please also consider joining our new school community. Bye for now.